This was a joint work between basically me slash our department and uh, the School of Energy Systems. And um, yeah, actually the second author is my wife, so that's why the name is the same, and uh, her supervisor. And we were basically combining her work on power plants with uh, basically our uh, machine no uh, learning knowledge and um, yeah, tried to get something useful out of it. And I hope we did. So um, yeah, I will shortly walk you through it. So um, I directly come to the point. So um, water consumption uh, by power plants is actually one topic that is often neglected. So we see that in Europe, about 40% of the freshwater withdrawal uh, accounts for, uh, or the, uh, sorry, in the United States, uh, are accounted for by the energy sector. Uh, freshwater in this case means, for instance, like water from lakes, so um, not seawater. Seawater would be from, from the sea or from, for instance, from the ocean. Um, in the European Union, it's 55%, uh, but it's sea and freshwater, so for US, just the number was not available. And in general, this can be considered a hidden footprint because many people are not aware of the fact that so much of the water is actually used for this purpose. And when you uh, consider the fact that in some regions water is actually a scarce resource, then this is something that should be addressed in the future. But in order to address it, of course, you first need to understand uh, what is the reason for this and uh, what are the contributors. And by the way, this is an interesting uh, picture that was uh, put there. So, uh, that is actually water steam and not CO2, something that, to be honest, I was not aware of for a long time. I always thought there was CO2, but I'm not an engineer. So that is actually water steam there that is used for cooling. So I think those are even cooling towers, but that is the expertise of, <laughs> of the engine, uh, energy system school. Okay, so um, then in general about the missing value imputation. So, um, Power plants use water mainly for cooling, so not for other purposes, but for the cooling um, of the overall processes. Like for instance, nuclear energy, you, you are aware of that there is a lot of water used in that regard. And um, there are actually gaps in the data, so it's not for all power plants known what kind of cooling technology they have, but it's important to know in order to be able to basically estimate what's the overall water demand. Um, then, of course, the choice of the cooling system depends on many different factors. So um, I'm not saying they are, um, they are basically exclusive, so there can be additional factors, but the size of the power plant, so if it's a bigger one or a smaller one, uh, the, the type, so what kind of, for instance, generator type there might be, uh, the availability and the temperature of water. So in some regions, if you don't have water, you, can, you cannot use a cooling technology that requires a lot of water, right? Uh, and of course also the temperature has to be suitable for that uh, purpose. And then some other factors like, okay, the, the, the region or if there are regulatory requirements, if you're allowed to use certain um, technologies or if you're required to use a certain mix of cooling technologies, for instance. And um, of course there have been other approaches to actually impute those missing values. So for power plants where it's not known what cooling technology they use. Uh, a very common one is actually use the market share, which basically would be, okay, you are in a country and you know they use, I don't know, 50% cooling towers, then another 20% dry cooling and so on. And for those uh, power plants you don't know, you just say, okay, I have this capacity that is not known for me, and 50% of course then is the cooling tower, 20% is this and so on. So just on the existing, from the existing um, market shares, you would infer for the unknown what is their cooling technology. But there are, of course, also other approaches, some of the more recent, like from 2014, so use uh, cooling portfolio mix, for instance, uh, of the generator fuel type combination. Um, historical development, of course, how was it in the past? Um, is it, for instance, moving towards more or a higher share of, of dry cooling, for instance? Um, and based on the location, that is also an interesting part because um, you can imagine the closer the power plant is to a water source, whether it's seawater or fresh water, the more likely it is, statistically speaking, that they actually use this kind of water for the cooling purposes. And there has been previous research on this, and um, they actually validated it from the energy school, and they, for instance, found that for the US, um, all the power plants, or from the power plants that with, are within 20 kilometers of the coastline, so rather close to a water source, about 92% use actually that water. Some of them don't, but it's, it, you cannot say it for all of them because there are some power plants which are extreme. They use the water source even though it's rather far away and they transport it via pipes or in other, uh, in other ways. And there are others which are close to water but anyway don't use it. So 
There are, of course, some exceptions, but the majority that are close to water, for instance, would use it. And this is also one factor that we used, um, of course, in our model. Okay, um, and then there are some um, possible inputs, basically, that you can use, some that were previously applied, and some uh, additional knowledge that can also be included in those models. Um, of course, the location of the power plant, as, as I just mentioned, for instance, how, how far close it is to the uh, water source, um, the region itself, climate conditions, for instance, um, because that would contribute, of course. If you don't have much water or the climate is very hot, then, of course, they're less likely to use the water resources they have for this purpose and rather for other purposes. Uh, the size of the power plant, as I mentioned, um, type of the fuel used, so there's also some differentiation in that for the thermal power plants, um, the type of generator, of course, and then we have um, some of the other factors which are um, available. So year of commissioning, so when was the power plant basically started or built? Um, the market share, of course, and the, uh, as mentioned before, so the portfolio mix can also be a factor. So there are many different factors that can be used in order to predict basically what, um, what might be the potential cooling technologies for those power plants for which you don't know it. Of course, there are also other factors that, that play into that but those are re usually hard to measure. If there would be, for instance, some relationship between the politician and the owner of the power plant, you cannot model that because you, you are not aware of whether there is an influence. But those are some factors, for instance, some of those that, that we used. Um, now concerning the database in general, so the database consists of about 14,000 uh, power plants worldwide, and um, there was a focus on the ones that are larger than 50 megawatts, so um, not that small. Um, that has one simple reason, because those data was validated by the, um, by the energy school, more specifically by my wife over a period of more than six months, um, via um, aerial imagery. So basically you go, uh, in the database there is the location, and you need, you need to validate, is actually at that location the power plant? That's the first thing, and that is usually not true. Their, their database was not that good, so you need to relocate it. And then you need to look at the power plant and try to identify what kind of cooling technology it has. And you need to have some specific training beforehand to be able to identify it, of course, visually, the different types, and assign it to the right uh, cooling technology. Um, sometimes or often it was, of course, available, but you need to still double check. And sometimes it was not available, and you um, try to identify it anyway, and then put it there. But still, of course, um, around 9% of the total global capacity was, uh, for this capacity, was not able to identify what's the cooling technology. And that sounds rather big, but, uh, or maybe it doesn't sound big to you, but it, it's, um, it's not that big. But especially if you look at in which countries you, you have the problem, you understand that it's not as big of a problem. Because you see that actually in those countries where, where you would expect that there is a lot of data available, there is also this data available. So for Europe, US, Australia, for instance, you you've can for most of them identify what is the cooling technology. More problematic are, for instance, uh, those countries. So you see those are not non-European countries. And Bahrain is the maximum with 41%. But also uh, China is a big problem because um, most of the information that, uh, that is provided usually is from governmental sources, but from China you cannot get all that data. So China is not explicitly mentioned here, but you can imagine that they account, even if they have a small percentage, they account for a big share um, of the aggregated capacity. And here is a, a nice picture of the different uh, power plants and uh, what type they are, so if they're coal, gas, oil, or nuclear. Okay, so that is basically the starting point. We have the problem that about 9% of the aggregated um, capacity is, uh, is unknown, or there is 9% of uh, aggregated capacity. And what I should also mention is that aggregated can mean that it's either, for instance, one power plant or multiple power plants within a country. It's just not known because you couldn't identify either the power plant or you couldn't identify the cooling source. Both is possible. But you are aware, based on governmental data, that there should be this capacity. Okay, so now we'll shortly go to um, an introduction to classification and the decision tree, and then we'll come to uh, the results that we gathered. So basically, as you probably know, a common type in machine learning, uh, especially, of course, in, in supervised learning, is classification, despite regression, of course, which is usually uh, concerned with um, that you have observations and certain information, so certain features or variables, and based on those, you want to assign them to discrete classes. So usually you assign them to one class only. 
And um, it has been applied successfully in many fields. I think that is also obvious for most of you. I mean, I made some examples in the medical sphere. You have it in credit scoring, whether a customer is a good customer or not, whether you want to give them a loan or not, but also in, um, in, other, uh, in other points. So recommendation systems in, in, product, uh, in product context. So if uh, the product has a malfunction or not, you want to sort it out from the production line. Um, those are some common, common issues. So those are just some examples in this context. Okay, and now um, we come to the decision tree classifier. Um, the most, um, yeah, the most um, popular um, publication in this is about the classification and regression trees from uh, 1984 from Breiman. And um, the basic concept is basically that the decision tree, which is a class, of course, of classification algorithms, uh, uses um, recursive partitioning. So it's dividing the, the space uh, the feature space in order to assign observations to the classes. And the basic idea is that you usually, uh, you have a starting point, so you have all the data, and you divide it, so you partition it by, uh, from itself, that's why recursively. So you have the whole data and subdivided and further subdivided until you have decision regions which are as pure as possible. Usually use some uh, impurity measure, meaning um, how diverse basically the classes in that data is. And you try, of course, to make it as pure as possible, meaning that you want to have basically uh, decision regions where you, basi uh, where you only have one class or where there's only few other observations from other classes. That, that is the basic idea. And um, yeah, decision tree because you start at the root and you basically, by making decisions, you branch out those, um, uh, those nodes. Um, in our context, we use a binary decision tree, but of course, others are also possible. And um, the most uh, basic one, of course, um, it uses e one variable at a time, but there are also more advanced methods. But um, we, for now, stuck to the original, uh, original version that is binary. So at each time, just splits uh, over a variable into two branches. Uh, and that does it with one, one variable at a time. Okay, I just tried to illustrate here the basic example. So um, you basically, for instance, have here in two-dimensional space, you have, uh, you have uh, the black dots and the red dots, and the idea is to divide, divide that space, and you see that those are, by the way, uh, in 90-degree angles because you really just account for one variable at a time. As I said, there might be more advanced methods that use it um, with multiple variables at a time, but the initial idea was based on one per time. And basically, you would have a certain... Um, a certain impurity in the beginning, and then you divide uh, the, the feature space in a way that the impurity decreases as much as possible. And for instance, you would start here, and after many uh, subdivisions, so you have it divided the data here, you subdivide it then here, for instance, then here, and then you also see you ha would have this area, and you subdivide it again. So there's where the recursive part in the partitioning comes in. And this, of course, would be uh, the case where you basically you can classify all the observations optimally because you see there's no misclassification. But you could argue that this example is an example of overfitting. But this is just um, an illustration of what is the basic idea behind this algorithm. Okay. And this would be, for instance, the corresponding uh, decision tree, which is basically a set of rules that represents this recursive partitioning. So you have the set of rules. You have initially 50% um, basically uh, 50% one data and 50% from, from the other. And then you have the criteria. Is the income, for instance, smaller than 60? If yes, then in this group. If no, then this group. And then you have the additional rules. This would be the second variable. Is that over or under a certain value? And you go further. And then, of course, you can branch out further. Um, and the basic idea is, of course, you don't want to branch too much, not in order to overfit. So that would be the topic of tree pruning. You want to keep the tree rather small in order not to overfit the data so that it also works with previously unseen data. But this is the basic idea, and you can see why it's called a decision tree. It's basically a tree that grows downwards. Okay, and this was the basic methodology that we used. So we initially had, uh, had the data and we uh, focused on the top three cooling technologies. Why did we do that? Because when we used all of the cooling technologies, the, the results were usually not that good because for uh, problems with more classes, uh, the accuracy is usually lower um, for, for different reasons. But since the top three cooling technologies on average accounted for 96% of the cooling technologies that seem to be suitable, 
Uh, and also the variation was not that big. So the minimum was, I think, 82%. So the top three always represent a huge or a very large share of the overall, um, of the overall number of cooling technologies. And uh, that's why that seemed, uh, seemed plausible. And then basically this step is actually just uh, necessary because of the uh, cross-validation data. So we need a certain amount of samples for each class in order to be able to run the cross-validation because if we don't have enough samples, it doesn't work. And then basically we had two different approaches. The main one is of course this one. So if you have at least two cooling technologies, you can make a decision tree. If you have one or none that would uh, fulfill those criteria, then you assign it just to the majority class which is actually basically the benchmark. The benchmark is just assigning to the majority class and say, hey, what's the most common cooling, te uh, cooling technology? And all aggregated is assigned to that. Um, or of course, if you have two or more available, you can actually use our decision tree. Um, as I mentioned, it's a binary decision tree and uh, we used a hyperparameter optimization of the minimum leaf size. So of how many observations need to be in each of the branches of the tree. Uh, we used k-fold cross-validation. I think it was five-fold uh, in this case. Um, this classification rate, so basically one minus the accuracy was our objective function. And the splitting criterion is, is the, basically the, the basic one. Also actually the default one that is used in MATLAB, which is the Gini diversity index or also called Gini impurity index. And um, yeah, then we have here shortly an overview of the result before I go a little bit more into detail. But uh, the basic idea was that, um, so on the overall data set, um, if, if you would just assign it um, based on majority class, you would get this accuracy of 71%. If you use our model, you would get to 82.8, which is an increase of 16.8%, not percentage points, but percent. Um, but of course, that also includes this part. So if you want to focus on the, this part only, then we would have a majority class would lead to 65.2%. Well, we lead to 82.1%. So there's a significant increase. So basically that increase here is just diluted because for some power plants, we don't have the number of observations and that's why they would also assigned, would be assigned to the majority class. So we can uh, lead to an improvement. Now the question is for what kind of power plants actually does this lead to an improvement? So um, what we found is that um, when we look at the different categories of improvement, then uh, to a certain extent, of course, it's intuitive, but the biggest improvements were uh, done for those power plants that beforehand were not very well um, assigned. So you can from that infer that for those, um, for those countries or for many of those countries where there actually was a diverse mix of, um, of cooling technologies, so in the top three, it was rather equally uh, distributed. Of course, the assignment to the majority class is not good. Because if you can imagine, if you have top three and it's almost one third, one third, one third, assigning it to majority class will be around 30%. So on average in this class, it would be around a little more than 40%. But of course, for those, we can basically lead to the best improvement, given that there is some kind of pattern in the data, and that seems to be the case. So there, actually, we can improve it quite a lot, but those are only two samples. But you see the tendency for those that are actually already quite good, you can only lead to marginal improvements. And those who are already quite good with a majority assignment, of course, have the majority of observations already in one cooling technology. And then, of course, to a certain extent, the imbalance in the data also takes effect. But we, we tried also, of course, to do oversampling, but actually that was not improving the results. So uh, what you see is what I mentioned already before. Overall, the improvement is about 16.8%. So you see previously was around 70, then we increased to 82, and those around 12 percentage points is around 16% of the data, 16% uh, of an improvement. And you see that based on the category, we had different improvements, but in each of those categories, we had an improvement. Um, of course, not for each power plant, because some power plants, as I said, didn't have enough observations, so we just had to stick to the majority class assignment. And then, um, yeah, what I just said, largest incremental improvements for those which were previously not well assigned. Um, then, of course, about the implications of, of, in general, of the work. So the approach represents a universal method, so that can be, in general, applied for each region, each country. That, uh, that is not a problem, but it's, of course, necessary of, that you have a good amount of observations if you want to improve on the majority class assignment. And um, so what is important for uh, energy systems to mention is that you can do it on a national level, regional, or also global, so that is fine. 
and that it will actually support um, the point that I was making in the beginning, that you can then assess what are the water risks because you better understand where is the water actually used and how much might be used and um, also conduct the environmental planning and eventually hopefully have some pol uh, policy implications and that the, um, that the politicians will act on it and basically be aware of those risks and maybe even decrease them if possible. So that if, for instance, they might face water shortage in the future, um, due to different reasons, temperature increases or population increases or, or other factors, that they can actually act on this information. And um, yeah, since it also incorporates the analysis of it, uh, historical trends, it will be also used in, in future studies. Um, especially by the uh, Lutz School of uh, Energy Systems, but maybe we'll also find some uh, future work in this part. Okay, so um, just shortly concluding on the overall topic. So um, we presented a first attempt on actually using machine learning and not just using simple assignments, for instance, to majority class or using the, the portfolio mix or the, the country trend um, in order to um, basically impute those missing values dismissing information on the cooling uh, information. Um, using the classif uh, classification, the decision tree that uses classification, um, together with the majority class, we could improve the accuracy over just using the majority class. Um, of course, those results are also basically representative for the overall data, given that um, this accounts for 96% of the data. So even if that would not be good for the remaining 4%, we still get uh, much better results. Um, and we achieve, of course, the higher improvements for the more diverse classes, so where the accuracy was before quite low, comparably. Um, yeah, in the end, the, the advantage of the decision tree is that, um, first, uh, yesterday talked about feature selection, and this is one of the methods that basically has embedded feature selection in it, because to, in order to determine the branches, it has to select the feature that best separates the classes, right? So that is basically an embedded feature selection because it finds the best features and only uses those and doesn't use those that are not good. So that is one advantage of the approach and also of course that it's easily interpretable because you can basically output the decision tree model and you see what decisions were made. You can see what are the rules based on which the assignment was done and further interpret um, if this is plausible of course and why this might be the reason and you understand it quite well. And um, yeah, but future work can also include, for instance, other classification algorithms, but then, of course, if you want to have the interpretability, you need to use some uh, approaches that you can interpret well. When you start to use more, uh, more fancy models, it might get more difficult. If you try to use complex neural network or deep learning, it will be quite difficult to understand actually which features contribute. Okay, yeah, I think that summarizes it hopefully well, and then I would thank you for your attention and ask if you have any questions.